Hi, hey everybody. Thanks for logging on. Thanks for joining us at uh, part of an ongoing and really incredibly important conversation. It was important before COVID, but even as the pandemic continues to head forward, it really has kind of brought to light how much we need to be talking about this and how much this needs to be a topic of conversation in the architecture profession. And what we're really getting into today is talking about this idea of designing for support and creating space for the most vulnerable students who, who exist in our schools. And in supporting these most vulnerable students, we're talking specifically about the homelessness crisis that exists in American public schools and, and how, how to design to support those most vulnerable students. But in order to get started, uh, let's first introduce all three of the presenters. Uh, first, um, I'm Tasha Lightning. I'm the Director of Research and Experience Development for NAC Architecture. I'm an applied psychology specialist, uh, usually focusing in cognitive psychology and user experience. And what I do for NAC is really just try to understand the real human impact of design and the real human impact of, of the kind of spaces that we create. My name is Elena Giovanni. I'm principal of at NAC Architecture and one of the educational thought leaders. Uh, one of my focus in the last five years has been in the intersection between education and homelessness. And I'm Kevin Flanagan. I've been the principal and educational planner on a number of um, projects that have been recognized nationally uh, for innovative design in support of students and the educational experience. Okay, great. I'm glad everybody had a chance to to introduce themselves and just moving on, what we are talking about today is a, a very sensitive topic and a very, very important topic, like I mentioned before. It's the homelessness crisis in the United States and how that homelessness crisis has bled into American public schools. And just moving forward to look at some of the statistics here, each year, uh, various offices for homelessness sponsored by government, sponsored by state agencies, and even private agencies, they do what's called a point in time count for homelessness. And what a point in time count is, is at any given time, it gives a picture of how many people are experiencing homelessness at that one point in time. It's a massive undertaking. It's a huge study conducted on a single night, typically in January or February. And the number of, of homeless individuals either completely unsheltered living on the street or living in homeless shelters are counted. And this kind of gives us a picture of how many, how many individual homeless people there are at any one given randomly selected time. And that's over 560,000 people in the United States. And what that has kind of turned into as far as student homelessness is this, this real this real issue in this real crisis where students under the age of 18 are experiencing this as well and are experiencing this with their families. And at any point during the academic year, over 1.5 million American students are experiencing homelessness and are experiencing the challenges that come with that. And I really wanna take a moment to, to kind of step back and understand that I know that I'm not alone in, uh, in coming to the issue of homelessness at the very beginning of, you know, years ago when I started working in various capacities with disadvantaged populations, even before my time at NAC, you, some of us come to this with this understanding or lack of understanding, I should say, about the uh, reality of the homeless population. And we tend to come at it from a place of, of privilege and a place of really thinking, oh, well, you know, the homelessness crisis, it's, it's, the, it's the consequences of their own actions. There's not a whole lot to be done and a whole lot to think there. But when you really get down to it, you you find that the the situation around this is far, far more complex. And when you get down to the experiences of families and the experiences of students who are the, the everyday students that we think of as the future of our country, it's something that really just needs to be understood and really needs to be translated into any kind of helping profession, including the profession of architecture. And that translation has the potential to really make a huge difference in the lives of this, these 1.5 plus million students 
who have a much more complex reality than some of us initially come to these first conversations thinking that they may. And pushing that into the architecture profession, what we can really do as researchers, as designers, as architects, tech support, anything within this profession, we first kind of have to understand the issue. We have to come at it from a point of first recognizing our own biases and then understanding the real issues and the real human level experience of individuals who are experiencing homelessness and individuals who are at risk of experiencing homelessness. And through doing that, we can adapt our thinking in space planning and in space design to really address those issues and to really bring supportive spaces into kind of these most vulnerable students. And that leads us into kind of a reimagining of what the educational sphere can really do for students and what the educational space can really become, which allows us to develop this transformative mindset around either, you know, in the wonderful opportunities that were sometimes given to build a school from the ground up with everything it needs, or in the sometimes much more common opportunities to just renovate an already existing building or to really try to help a district reimagine the space that they already have. It builds this transformative mindset around really what we're doing to, to create spaces and to create supportive environments for these most vulnerable students. And we have a unique position to kind of be a liaison between that space and between the, the principals and the superintendents and the teachers and the stakeholders in those schools to really sustain these programs and to really sustain the effect of this space. And uh, Kevin, I know you've done quite a bit of work uh, with the Seattle Public Schools on really kind of delving into this five point process and, and how that has kind of created a, a different understanding of, of the school space. Can you maybe speak a little bit to that? Well, yeah, I think one of the interesting things was bringing together different people and different points of view, uh, where I'll say traditionally it feels like a, the design process often happens with a, you know, an architect and a facilities department, maybe with some input from some educators. And in really addressing this, there was a much broader outreach that brought together a lot of uh, agencies and support people. And one of the things that was kind of fun and interesting with that was these were people that themselves don't necessarily cross paths. And so through the design and planning of the school that brought together um, this much larger network of support for families uh, together to talk about uh, imagining what the new school could be like. That's wonderful. And if you move on to the, the next slide, what we really build a picture of is when we develop this understanding is who are we helping? What is this for? And these results are, you know, they're not out out here, they're, they're tangible and they're real. And the kinds of students that we're helping are those who experience food, shelter, safety, insecurity, traumas, resource insecurity. They're often, they can be students who are disabled or disadvantaged in one way or another. They can be LGBT students. They can be English language learners, migrants who have cultural differences. And typically these students are unlikely really to remain at the same school year round. So they worry about making friends. They worry about belonging and community, which are really critical for student success and for social emotional learning throughout life. And in addition to this, we kind of have these students as a result of all of these disadvantages who are really extraordinarily less likely to graduate high school with only 30% scoring proficient on state standardized testing and a, an overall 30% national dropout rate for these students from year to year. And when I say these students, I say students who maybe are not even chronically homeless, but who have experienced homelessness at some point in their life. Uh, either younger, older, doesn't matter. At some point in their life, they've experienced, experienced these difficulties and these traumas, and it really hurts their chances of graduation from high school. And what we can do when we try to help this issue any way we can is we can get some intervention for these children who are experiencing poverty and are, as a result, the data shows us they are more likely to experience poverty and homelessness and, and struggles as an adult. And if we can intervene as best we can, as early as we can, it really kind of helps 
helps that issue for these children who struggle with fear, trauma, stress, ridicule, and of course, problems with authority due to mistreatment and stigmatization that, that families in poverty and families experiencing homelessness often unfortunately experience. And we're really lucky to have Elena here. She has been working with the community of friends in Los Angeles for, for quite a long time. And if she, you wanna tell us a little bit about, about their work and, and your work with them. Yes, uh, so I have been working with homelessness issue and, and now a crisis, right? For almost uh, 20 years, uh, serving as a board member for a community of friends. Uh, a community of friends is the largest uh, nonprofit housing developer in California that provides what we call a permanent supportive housing for homeless people and families living with mental illness. Uh, we have actually in our buildings now over 600 school age children live in our buildings. Uh, when you think about homelessness, uh, we often don't think that there are children involved, but there are a lot of them because they are not on the streets, but they are in shelters. So for us, a, a community of friends, we, it became very important that we provide uh, support services for school aged children in our buildings. And for us, uh, for me as an architect that does design for schools, understanding their needs and really thinking about what is the intersection between education and learning and the uh, homeless, living with homelessness. And in order, when we see that kind of work and when we see that kind of involvement, we, we understand that we're, we're really kind of increasing this comfort and educational access when we bring that kind of thinking, that kind of wonderful thing that you know, the community of friends has to the school atmosphere. We, we increase that comfort, we increase that access, we increase the graduation likelihood, we, we are able to help break the cycle of poverty for those students, and we're able to create a safer and more understanding environment for all students, not just the students who are experiencing homelessness and who are experiencing poverty, because often we'll see that more adaptable students will, will also thrive in these environments. And what we, when we start to understand this issue, we really start to go into, uh, we, we wanna do the best that we can and we want to really create as much understanding as we can. And liaisons working with these students tends to tend to divide the needs between these between these students into a couple of different tiers. And this is a graphic is a really good illustrative example of, you know, those tier one being the most important, tier three being still incredibly important, but less so of course than the basic needs of, you know, tier one and tier two. And we see, we see things like enough food to eat, transportation to and from school, emotional and motivational support and mentorship, things that the school environment can really help with. And we consider designing with these things in mind, we understand that the staff liaisons that work with these students, you know, 85, 87, 80% are saying that these areas are incredibly important for students and the students are agreeing, yes, we need these things. These are important for us. These, these are things that we need to do well in school. These are things that we struggle with on the day to day. So the agreement is there that they're very important, but what we do end up finding, uh, we'll see in the next slide is that there's kind of this disconnect between the liaisons in the schools and the spaces that are provided, thinking that they're doing a really good job with these things and the reality for the students and how they're experiencing it, particularly in those basic need areas of having enough food to eat, transportation to and from school, basic clothing and school supplies, things that we tend to overlook, particularly with clothing, uh, as, as something that students will, will need as a necessity to get to school. Help with college prep, academic tutoring and support, dealing with all of those distractions. A lot of liaisons are thinking that their districts are doing a really good job and their schools are doing a really good job, but there's some kind of disconnect there that is pushing the percentages of the youth who are affected from, from really either receiving that benefit, accessing all of those programs or engaging with them in such a way. And going into the research, what we find is that it has a lot to do with coming, at, I like to call it coming at it from too wholesome of an approach too quickly, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But what we all try to do, those of us who have not experienced homelessness, those of us who have not experienced poverty, poverty is what we tend to do is we start in the middle of this 
uh, Maslow's hierarchy for human needs. Abraham Maslow was a, a, psycho a prominent psychologist who developed this tiered system of needs that need to be met uh, first and foremost at the base of the pyramid, moving on to uh, different needs and different whole person approaches as those needs uh, are met. And those of us who have not struggled or those of us who don't know what it's like tend to want to start in the middle. We want that love and belonging and that friendship and that engagement. And for all of the students to know that they matter and that we care about their education. And that's fantastic and wonderful and wholesome. And I love that. But where we need to start is we need to start on those physiological needs. We need to understand that a shelter is an insecurity. Food is an insecurity. Clothing is an insecurity. It, with safety and personal security, they're not sure where they're going to sleep, if they're going to be able to sleep, if they're going to be safe, if they're going to be cold, where their next meal is going to come from. We need to rethink the way that we create space and that we design space in schools to make sure that those physiological needs can be met first so that students are not distracted and that so students can thrive and really focus on developing that love and belonging and developing that esteem and developing the self-actualization that they need to succeed in school. But first, those basic needs need to be met and they need to be supported. And I'll turn it over to Kevin for uh, a really unique project that we were able to get very involved in and, and really put this kind of stuff into practice. So with Northgate Elementary School, we wanted to uh, use that as a case study for how we might apply the kind of the thinking to meet those basic level needs uh, at a, for a population that is a fairly vulnerable population. And working with Seattle Public Schools, we got started first um, uh, trying to understand these needs more and looking at other places that were, what are they doing to help address this? So we looked at places like uh, Santa Ana and Los Angeles Unified School Districts, as well as uh, a place called uh, Positive Tomorrows, which is a school designed by MA Architecture. Uh, it's in Oklahoma, designed exclusively for students experiencing homelessness. So with that, I think they did a very nice job of um, evaluating and understanding some of the needs unique to this population. And just to pull out a couple of things uh, that I think that they did a nice job with was, one was the ownership of space and certain things like related to um, partly that sense of belonging, but also partly that uh, a sense of privacy and control and, uh, and safety that really comes with that, um, that comes with that, having some control and familiarity with the space that you're in. Uh, another is thinking about possessions. And really interestingly, just developmentally for elementary age children to start with, they're at a point where they're learning how to take care of possessions. They have their things and they're taking care of them. And then that becomes amplified for students experiencing homelessness where they want to be taking care of their things, but they don't necessarily have a safe or reliable place um, to keep them. They don't necessarily have a stable home or environment where these things can be kept. So they might bring all of their belongings with them to school so that they have them with them. Now there's the question to say, what do you do with these things once they're at school? So it's thinking about a place for these things so that the students can feel like their possessions are safe, that they're well taken care of. It helps allay some of the anxiety they can have related to that to focus more on their education. So picking up from what we've learned from others and starting to apply it to Northgate, um, we got started working with uh, the school district and as I said, that network of providers as well as the, the families, the students, the teachers that are part of the school to really understand on a more personal level um, what's going on there and how to meet these basic needs. Uh, Northgate is a school that has a um, pretty high percentage of homelessness, uh, about 25% of students at any one time might be experiencing homelessness, as well as 40% transient students. Um, what I love is the principal there, Dee Dee Fauntleroy. She's aware of and very tuned into all of the statistics and the meanings behind them. But to her, the most important statistic is these kids are 100% awesome. They don't lead with their adversity, they lead with hope, they lead with love, and they lead with support. Northgate is a wonderful supportive community environment within the school of uh, the people supporting people at the school to try and fill in those gaps that people might otherwise fall into. And uh, it's 
then in thinking about the design of a school, we start thinking about how typically I feel like when we design, we design for the middle of the bell curve. It makes sense. That way you're meeting the needs of most people. But as we started working on Northgate, we started thinking, what if we started designing for the most vulnerable students? What if we made that our primary design focus? With the thought being that those that are less vulnerable, those coming from more stable home environments, those that have had a chance to eat and sleep at night, maybe those are the ones that are more able to adapt rather than expecting the most vulnerable students to adapt to the norm. And if we design for those most vulnerable students, maybe what we'll create are environments that really are supportive for all. Uh, I was thinking, Tasha, about the example you gave with that texting. Oh, that's right, yeah. Uh, texting, so originally texting, text messaging was designed for the deaf. It was designed as an adaptive way for the deaf to communicate with cellular communication when it was first first being created and first being kind of pulled into the mainstream and just think to yourself how much we all love it, how much we all use it, how much it has blossomed as its own technology that is that has been adapted and just kind of beloved by everyone who gets involved with, with technology. And what we find is that, as Kevin was saying, when you design for vulnerability and when you design for for maybe the lower end of the bell curve than others who are able, more able to adapt will find that they thrive with those environments as well and with those technologies and the forms of texting. So with that, we wanted to understand from the Northgate community more deeply as far as what is going on and how might we support that. And so a lot of those things that Tasha has talked about already um, were coming up, um, you know, trust in that idea of authority figures, um, have uh, it, people in these conditions have often developed a, uh, a lack of trust with the people that are running the school. And so while I know them to be wonderful, warm people, uh, there's a disconnect that's going on there and a lack of trust and which prevents um, opportunities for connection and development that might happen for the students and the families. Um, and that relates to, I uh, think in part, a sense of safety. And I think it relates also to um, discipline. Uh, what we see a lot in schools is that those that are most vulnerable are the ones that end up receiving discipline and being disciplined for uh, at a much higher rate than, than other students. Uh, African-American males um, are a group that see the highest level of discipline. And unfortunately, what we also see is there's an inverse relationship between the amount of discipline uh, to, as it goes to academic success and graduation. So we started thinking with the design of buildings, is there a way that we can think about that that um, allows for interventions to happen at a different place and way before things escalate? Um, another thing that came up was withdrawal. And that goes back to, I think, some of those um, core fundamental sociological uh, aspects that uh, Tasha noted in Maslow's hierarchy. We heard the story about uh, this girl at Northgate. She'd come to school with a blanket and then she would um, at times in the day, whether it's anxiety or stress or whatever it is, she would just take the blanket and pull it up over her head and just kind of disappear behind her blanket for a while. And so it's, again, understanding what's going on there. She's sort of creating her own physical environment when she's doing that. So as architects, we want to learn from that and think about how can we make an environment that will uh, be supportive of people that need to have that chance to withdraw. So as we started to design Northgate, this is the layout of the school. And we thought of it in this idea of uh, this tapestry of spaces, that there's a lot of different spaces, different scale for different size gathering, different energy levels um, throughout the school to allow the opportunity to provide spaces to meet the students for where they are at a given point in time. And then uh, with that, we also, we were talking with someone and they said, you know what, when I, go to a school, it feels like every time I go, whatever school it is, there's the doors, you open up the door and walk into the school and there's just this hallway with doors on either side. And it just, it feels like an institution and it doesn't feel like it's a place where I belong. It doesn't feel like a place that wants me. And so we said, let's think about that differently. So Northgate was designed with this meandering path and the classrooms uh, arranged in neighborhoods that branch off of that path. And so that when you walk into the school, what you walk into is much more of a community space that has um, 
light and it has uh, some transparency and you can see from the entry through into the library space and through that to the outdoors. You can turn to the left and see to the commons. Um, there's nooks and seating in order to allow places to, uh, to gather and to uh, feel welcome into the school. In the layout of the school here with the entry on the right hand side of the drawing and uh, kind of moving through the school down the meandering path, uh, the classrooms are arranged in uh, neighborhoods of three classrooms with each classroom having the amenities that are part of that uh, tapestry of spaces um, throughout. And so that there's um, always something as far as within your own neighborhood uh, to provide the support uh, for every student. And then as we start to look more at the entry area, um, zooming in on that, uh, we have a, a security vestibule that you come into. And if you turn to the left upon entry, you go into the administrative area and you check in at the office. But something that we developed uh, working with um, the, the various groups, there was the idea of this family room and a place that's connected, uh, but also disconnected from the uh, administration and front of the school. It was interesting that uh, Kevin, that, right, we spent a lot of time discussing about this space, uh, where they should be located, how they, how do we design them to provide resources and access to programs to support the students and their families. Uh, there were pros and cons in the location, close administration. Pros for with that was uh, that uh, you have support of the staff. Cause was because as you were talking about stigma, stereotype, it's like the many students, these students that have a stigma, they're being in trouble when you go to the administration. So I think this was a good compromise. If it's not in the administration, it's close to it, but not necessary that you're going to the administration. And with the, this uh, family um, center that it also has a uh, it has some resources for parents as far as for computers and access so that they can um, uh, get access to whether they're doing job hunting or looking for housing or various support. Um, there's also thinking about places for they're likely to have some young kids in tow. So to have uh, like a little library play area for younger children while the parents are taking care of what they need to. Um, that there's a private conference room, a small little room. So if they need to make some private phone calls, if there's other parents or families that are in that space. Um, and also there's the family connections coordinators offices off that. And that's a person who is looking to connect with these families. And again, they're not always necessarily seeking out that. And so this puts the, um, the coordinator close to them. And so he can come and check in with them um, when he sees them in the room and just make sure as far as that they're getting the support that they need as well as having a storage room that has some basic supplies. Again, back to those foundational needs of uh, making sure that the parents and families are able to get uh, some of the basic supplies and get signed up uh, to make sure they're getting uh, food and housing and all of the other core necessities that they need in order for the students to be successful later on. And as we think more about the idea of the sense of community in the school, it has a you know, wonderful commons area that has a, a big space for gathering, as a lot of elementary schools do, and it can expand into the uh, gymnasium for bigger events. And as we're talking about this with one of the parents, um, she mentioned as far as, well, yeah, I don't know if that's always such a great place to be. And she, then she said that she's actually from a, grew up in a war-torn country and sort of big active spaces with large groups. that. It's not always a feeling like a safe place for everyone it can be sort of intimidating. And so while she sometimes wants to be involved in those things, those big events can also be scary. So we started thinking more about the edges also of these spaces and that people don't always necessarily want to be in the middle, but maybe there's a quieter space off to the side and to the edge where they might be. Or they might even move up a little bit further in this case, um, up above. And so they can be connected to what's going on in the big events, but a little bit protected further away. They might even step back a little bit further to the, uh, to the little nook across the way. So whatever it is, finding a way where a person can connect with community in a way that is uh, comforting to them and feels right and safe for them. And then as we move into that common space, it's looking to make it in a place that's uh, it's warm with these uh, kind of, you know, some warm wood tones and uh, has a big, um, uh, a lot of glass that opens up to the outdoors. And so there's a direct connection for the kids to go out to play, but also thinking after hours as far as if there's distribution of food um, or other events or activities that uh, this can be a community space that people can come to directly from the outdoors. 
Now moving into some of these academic areas. This is one of those three classroom neighborhoods uh, here. And with that, we have these, uh, these little colored um, ellipses on the plans to show some of those different scaled uh, spaces that are part of that tapestry. And uh, first I'll point out this idea of creating just a little nook in that classroom. And it's a place where just a student can just kind of crawl into the cubby there. And uh, you know, if thinking about that girl pulling the blanket over her head, this might be a place where you can just go disengage from whatever is going on and a chance for you to just disappear maybe a little bit um, in that space. And also within the same classroom, uh, there's this uh, window seat. And so a chance to, uh, another place to go that might have be room for two or three students, but again, a chance to maybe look outside and to kind of recenter and re-engage in a different way. Getting back to that conversation of discipline. If there's places as far as to allow a student to um, self-soothe to separate and to allow a situation to de-escalate. Um, just within the classroom, it's far more beneficial than to let something escalate until there's just a breaking point. Or even we might pull just outside of the classroom too. And so looking at this as a neighborhood where the support happens within the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> we have a shared area in between the classrooms with a lot of transparency from the classrooms for good supervision. This is a great place for project activities and group activities, but also you'll see that there's a, a nook that's in the background there. And, and that nook is another place as far as to pull back and to withdraw. Um, in this case, we're thinking about maybe having a, a, some aggregate stone or something very tactile so that it allows a little sensory break for the student. Again, for if they're doing some self-soothing, a chance to um, kind of recenter themselves. I talked to another teacher who mentioned about uh, having a, some students that just kind of need to move and to vocalize. And so creating a secure, protected outdoor space where the children can go out there. So again, whether it's a class activity that goes outside, um, it's a chance to connect with nature, but also it's a chance for a student to have that uh, um, another way to sort of reconnect or de-escalate in a safe uh, and supervisable space. And so with that, what we're looking to do is just create what might end up becoming you know, this tapestry of spaces that it's, uh, pro provides a variety of ways to meet the students uh, wherever they are at a given time to help meet those basic needs to, for them to feel safe, for them to regain control and to have um, an opportunity to succeed. And we feel like as far as that, it's not just meeting the needs of the most vulnerable students, but these might end up becoming best practices to support all the students. So one of the things we, we know for certain is that this pandemic has definitely expanded the population of students that we consider the most vulnerable. It has also put to test some of the best practice in how we design schools to support them. Some of the strategies and best practice we're gonna talk about has been, uh, has been implemented at Northgate. So I recently spoke uh, with Daniel Madrid, who is the Director of Family and Children's Services at the, um, at the Community of Friends. And he told me that most of the children in our buildings go to the Los Angeles Unified School District, uh, which is the second largest school district in, in, district in the country. So when the pandemic hit, uh, LAUSD distributed Chromebooks for over 600,000 students. So even though our students at the Community of Friends have been given Chromebooks, many of them were not able to make them work for just a variety of reasons. So if you think about it, um, uh, they, they just, the parents just didn't have the resources or sometimes they were just not equipped to help their students uh, in their kids in, at home. So as campuses continue to be closed, most of them of these vulnerable students are going to be left behind. And this is for many of them, it's gonna become a gap year. So although many of these issues are technology driven and the way the curriculum is being delivered right now by teachers and by the school districts, what are the design solutions that can help support them? So one of the things that the Daniel mentioned was that our kids at Community of Friends are pretty much locked in their homes all day long. There is almost uh, no place for them to go. So all of them uh, have lost the in-person support services that they will be able to provide, uh, that, that school districts were able to provide uh, for their students. So the question then is, how do we turn schools inside out? 
how do we start uh, thinking about the edges of schools and make them more accessible? Now that more than ever, uh, schools now have to be really center of community. So, so as we start thinking about edges of uh, school campus, how do we make them accessible to the most vulnerable students? How do we push all the spaces and we say outdoors and indoors to the edges so we can connect to the community? So this image uh, talks about the yard. Uh, in Southern California, many uh, parts of uh, the US, the outdoor can be used almost year round. So how do we make uh, the campus uh, when we start planning them, renovating them, uh, how do we maximize the ability of students to access these outdoor spaces all the time? The next one is about the porch. So the question is, can we and can the public reclaim these entry points, create a sense of place, the entrance uh, of the entry at the entrance and welcoming and supporting community connections. Many times parents of these uh, vulnerable students have to arrive earlier, uh, either because the shelter is closing the, uh, or they have to actually leave the shelter earlier or they have to come uh, leave, um, go back. So when they go earlier or either for drop off or pick up, there is a place that they need a place where they can hang out and actually socialize with other, other parents. Uh, the play arts, design them so students can learn while playing. Use game markings that, for social distance uh, if needed. Uh, the next one is uh, about uh, food security. During the pandemic, food service did not close. Most school districts uh, continue to serve meals. At LA USD, for instance, they were distributing food packages that had three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner to everyone that came to the school. No questions asked. So they started distributing food uh, by wheeling them out uh, like uh, through carts. So as, as you all know, most food services are designed inwards to serve students where they are in school, when they are in school. So we may need to think about how food services can serve students even when schools are closed. Uh, this uh, photo shows the culinary arts uh, program in a couple of schools. And um, there is a great opportunity to use the culinary arts also to support food and security. I know, Ta Tasha, you have mentioned the, the research that you've done that is quite a bit of some, uh, I mean, there's some pilot programs out there, right? Right, yeah. So in uh, supporting the early, early phases of Northgate Elementary Schools design and research, I came across some pilot studies and some pilot programs that use culinary programs in grades K through 12 to not only teach students how to cook nutritious meals, either on a budget or just with general ingredients, but also allows those students to develop trade skills for working in you know, commercial kitchens at the older levels. And in combination of doing both of those things, allows those students to take the object of their lesson, so the meal, home with them after school or eat it at lunch, depending on, on when when the program takes place. And what this does for impoverished and, and students experiencing homelessness is it separates getting help with a meal from the stigma that's often associated with that. In grades K through 12 at various levels of cognitive development, really all children want to do is they want to be like the children around them. They want to be like their friends. They want to be like everybody else in the school. And they don't want to do they really don't wanna do anything that's going to feel like it's singling them out. They don't wanna go into administration to get a backpack full of supplies when the program is known and other students are gonna know that's gonna make them feel very self-conscious. That's gonna be very othering to these students and it's really gonna make them feel different and separate from the community. So allowing these integrated culinary arts programs as a you know, theoretical pilot to kind of reduce that stigma and to allow students to say, oh, I'm in the culinary arts program. That's why I'm taking all of this food home with me. It separates them from that stigma and allows them to get access to those services without having to worry about that, that harm to the belonging that I'm sure we all remember for better or for worse, so occupies your mind when you're that age. The next image shows uh... Yeah, I love that program, Tasha. <laughs> I always love this story. So then this one, next one, ha having access to a variety of outdoor spaces. 
Last year, learning at Learningscapes conference, we had the privilege to invite Kaylee, a former homeless student, and her mother to join our panel. They all currently live at the Community of Friends uh, building. Uh, so Carrie, uh, Kelly shared uh, with us that recess time was an opportunity for her to sit by herself and sketch in her book while having lunch. So it helped her relieve, relieve her uh, stress. But what she said was that uh, most of the schools that, the, that she attended, she felt exposed during lunchtime because the, sp the spaces were always designed for outdoor spaces that for outdoor, uh, for bigger groups and not designed for uh, just if you wanted to sit alone. So that, that variety also has to happen also in indoor, uh, uh, indoor eating spaces. So there is important that we are conscious about that these spaces have to be accommodated in small groups, individual sitting areas, and also for people that choose to sit alone. Gardens, making them edible gardens. They're not only educational, but they also allow students to plant food that they can also take home. The next is which we talked quite a bit about the family room, so I won't talk more about it, but the importance of this resource uh, uh, room for uh, families. So as we start to talk about pushing uh, spaces to the edges uh, is the, any opportunity that we have to put multi-purpose rooms in the edges too. Because so we have learned that during the pandemic, our vulnerable students more than ever need the before and after school programs and including the uh, tutoring. Daniel was telling me that uh, the students at Community of Friends just uh, could not keep up with their homework that because they were online all day long and they just didn't have the resources. So having these programs and the spaces accessible are important uh, before and after hours. So Kelly also shared that because of her transient uh, life as, uh, as a homeless uh, student, she never wanted to make friends knowing that the, she may end up changing another shelter again and going, have to, going again to uh, another school. So, uh, so uh, making friends were very difficult for her. However, she did like the fact that project-based learning first forced her to make friends in smaller groups and help her focus on what she was learning. As, uh, as actually Tasha mentioned earlier, most of the homeless students suffer from trauma and they have difficulty focusing. So as an introvert, the next image shows about uh, some of the spaces that we have to accommodate for not only extrovert, but introvert. So as an introvert, uh, she really didn't enjoy having to be in groups. So the fact that we provi the provide a palette spaces of varying characters, varying sizes, so really supports the different uh, personalities so that they can not only sit them on their own, but maybe just a small group of friends or with a teacher or a counselor in, uh, in small groups of settings so they can have, again, some emotional support. So last but not least, uh, these students really need wraparound services for them and their families. So at Los Angeles Unified School District, and I know in Santa Ana and other school districts, they, they do have wellness uh, center, but for LAUSD, because of the size of them, they are allowed, they are able to actually have uh, these centers throughout what they call the regions to support the region, so a cluster of schools. This example is the San Bernardino High School. It's a clinic that's located in the high school and has different uh, clinic services, including dental. And this is a, a example where the school district partnered with the Los Angeles County Health Services. Uh, the land is provided by the school district and the funds for building it, it's a joint uh, funding between both agencies and the services are provided by the Los Angeles uh, County Health Services. So I just wanna end by uh, thank you all for joining us in this very important conversation. Like we learned from other case studies that some of you uh, have designed, we hope that you can also take some of the best practice that we have shared today and implement in your next projects. This is an evolving conversation that we all continue to learn more. So keep on sharing. And here there, in this slide, you have our contact uh, information and, and also 
a, a link for our uh, NAC lab where we have a lot of our research in uh, various uh, educational best practices. And we hope that you continue the conversation with us. Thank you.